2.11, driving at night. 2.11.1, it is more dangerous. You are at greater risk when you drive at night. Drivers cannot see hazards as quickly as in daylight, so they have less time to respond. Drivers caught by surprise are less able to avoid an accident. The problems of night driving involve the driver, roadway, and vehicle. 2.11.2 Driver Factors First is vision. Good vision is critical for safe driving. Your control of the brake, accelerator, and steering wheel is based on what you see. If you cannot see clearly, you will have trouble identifying traffic and roadway conditions, spotting potential trouble, or responding to problems in a timely manner. Because seeing well is so critical to safe driving, you should have your eyes checked regularly by an eye specialist. You may never know you have poor vision unless your eyes are tested. If you need to wear glasses or contact lenses for driving, remember to first always wear them when driving, even if driving short distances. If your driver's license has a corrective lenses restriction, it is illegal to move a vehicle without using corrective lenses. Next, keep an extra set of corrective lenses in your vehicle. If your normal corrective lenses are broken or lost, you can use the spare lenses to drive safely. Next, avoid using dark or tinted corrective lenses at night, even if you think they help with glare. Tinted lenses cut down the light that you need to see clearly under night driving conditions. Next is glare. First was vision, next is glare. Drivers can be blinded for a short time by bright light. It can take several seconds to recover from glare. Even two seconds of glare blindness can be dangerous. A vehicle going 55 miles per hour will travel more than half the distance of an American football field during that time. Next is fatigue and lack of alertness. Fatigue is physical or mental tiredness that can be caused by physical or mental strain, repetitive tasks, illness, or lack of sleep. Just like alcohol and drugs, it impairs your vision and judgment. Fatigue causes errors related to speed and distance, increases your risk of being in an accident, causes you to not see and react to hazards as quickly, and affects your ability to make critical decisions. When you are fatigued, you could fall asleep behind the wheel and crash, injuring or killing yourself or others. Fatigued or drowsy driving is one of the leading causes of traffic accidents. NHTSA estimates that 100,000 police reported accidents a year are the result of drowsy driving. According to the National Sleep Foundation's Sleep in America poll, I'm going to read that again. According to the National Sleep Foundation's Sleep in America poll, 60% of Americans have driven while feeling sleepy and more than one third or 36% or 103 million people admit to having actually fallen asleep at the wheel. Drivers may experience short bursts of sleep lasting only a few seconds or fall asleep for longer periods of time. Either way, the chance of an accident increases dramatically. At-risk groups. <clears throat> the risk of having an accident due to drowsy driving is not uniformly distributed across the population. Accidents tend to occur at times when sleepiness is most pronounced. For example, during the night and in the mid-afternoon. Most people are less alert at night, especially after midnight. This is particularly true if you've been driving for a long time. Thus, individuals who drive at night are more likely to have fall asleep accidents. Research has identified young males, shift workers, commercial drivers, especially long haul drivers, 
and people with untreated sleep disorders or with short-term or chronic sleep deprivation as being at increased risk for having a fall asleep accident. At least 15% of all heavy truck accidents involve fatigue. A congressionally mandated study of 80 long-haul truck drivers in the U.S. and Canada found drivers averaged less than five hours of sleep per day, FMLSA 1996. It is no surprise that the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, reported that drowsy driving was probably the cause of more than half of the accidents leading to truck drivers' death. NTSB 1990. For each truck driver fatality, another three to four people are killed. NHTSA 1994. Warning signs of fatigue. Many people cannot tell if or when they are about to fall asleep. Here are some signs that should tell you to stop and rest. First, difficulty focusing, frequent blinking, or heavy eyelids. Next, yawning repeatedly or rubbing eyes. Next, daydreaming and wandering or disconnected thoughts. Next, trouble remembering the last few miles driven and missing exits or traffic signs. Next, trouble keeping your head up. Next, drifting from your lane, following too closely, or hitting a shoulder rumble strip. Next, feeling restless and irritable. When you are tired, trying to push on is far more dangerous than most drivers think. It is a major cause of fatal accidents. If you notice any any signs of fatigue, stop driving and go to sleep for the night or take a 15 to 20 minute nap. Are you at risk? Before you drive, consider whether you are sleep deprived or fatigued as in six hours of sleep or less triples your risk next suffering from sleep loss insomnia poor quality sleep or sleep deprivation next driving long distances without proper rest breaks next driving through the night mid-afternoon or when you would normally be asleep many heavy motor vehicle accidents occur between midnight and 6 a.m Next, taking sedating medications such as antidepressants, cold tablets, antihistamines. Next, working more than 60 hours a week increases your risk by 40%. Next, working more than one job and your main job involves shift work. Next, driving alone or on a long rural, dark, or boring road. Finally, flying and changing time zone. Preventing drowsiness before a trip. First, get adequate sleep. Adults need eight to nine hours to maintain alertness. Next, prepare route carefully to identify total distance, stopping points, and other logistic logistic considerations. Next, Schedule trips for the hours you are normally awake, not in the middle of the night. Next, drive with a passenger. Next, avoid medications that cause drowsiness. Next, consult your physician if you suffer from daytime sleepiness, having difficulty sleeping at night, or take frequent naps. Next, incorporate exercise into your daily life to give you more energy. Maintaining alertness while driving. Protect yourself from glare and eye strain with sunglasses. Next, keep cool by opening the window or using the air conditioner. Next, avoid heavy foods. Next, be aware of downtime during the day. Next, have another person ride with you and take turns driving. Next, take periodic breaks about every 100 miles or two hours during long trips. Next, stop driving and rest or take a nap. Next, caffeine consumption can increase awareness for a few hours, but do not drink too much. 
It will eventually wear off. Do not rely on caffeine to prevent fatigue. Next, avoid drugs. While they may keep you awake for a while, they will not make you alert. If you are drowsy, the only safe cure is to get off the road and sleep. If you do not, you risk your life and the lives of others. 2.11.3 Roadway Factors Poor Lighting in the daytime, there is usually enough light to see well. This is not true at night. Some areas may have bright street lights, but many areas will have poor lighting. On most roads, you will probably have to depend entirely on your headlights. Less light means you will not be able to see hazards as well as in daytime. Road users who do not have lights are hard to see. There are many accidents at night involving pedestrians, bicyclists, and animals. Even when there are lights, the road scene can be confusing. Traffic signals and hazards can be hard to see against a background of signs, shop windows, and other lights. Drive slower when lighting is poor or confusing. Drive slowly enough to be sure you can stop in the distance you, see, you can see ahead. Drunk drivers. Drunk drivers and drivers under the influence of drugs are a hazard to themselves and to you. Be especially alert around the closing times of bars and taverns. Watch for drivers who have trouble staying in their lane or maintaining speed, stop without reason, or show other signs of being under the influence of alcohol or drugs. 2.11.4 Vehicle Factors Headlights at night, your headlights will usually be the main source of light for you to see by and for others to see you. You cannot see nearly as much with your headlights as you see in the daytime. With low beams, you can see ahead about 250 feet and with high beams, about 350 to 500 feet. You must adjust your speed to keep your stopping distance within your sight distance. This means going slowly enough to be able to stop within the range of your headlights. Otherwise, by the time you see a hazard, you will not have time to stop. Night driving can be more dangerous if you have problems with your headlights. Dirty headlights may give only half the light they should. This cuts down your ability to see and makes it harder for others to see you. Make sure your lights are clean and working. Headlights can be out of adjustment. If they do not point in the right direction, they will not give you a good view and can blind other drivers. Have a qualified person make sure they are adjusted properly. You must turn on your headlights first a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. Next, if snow, rain, fog, or other hazardous weather conditions require the use of windshield wipers. Next, when visibility is not sufficient to clearly see a person for a distance of a distance Read it again. When, visi when visibility is not sufficient to clearly see a person or a vehicle for a distance of 1,000 feet, CVC 280 and 24400. No vehicle may be driven only with only parking lights on. However, they may be used as signals or when the headlamps are also lighted, CVC 24800. Other light. In order for you to be seen easily, the following must be clean and working properly. Reflectors, marker lights, clearance lights, tail lights, identification lights. Turn signals and brake lights. At night, your turn signals and brake lights are even more important for telling other drivers what you intend to do. Make sure you have clean working turn signals and brake lights. Windshield and mirrors. It is more important at night than in the daytime to have a clean windshield and clean mirrors. Bright lights at night can cause dirt on your windshield or mirrors to create a glare of its own, blocking your view. Most people have experienced driving towards the sun just as it has risen or is about to set and found that they can barely see through a windshield that seemed to look okay in the middle of the day. Clean your windshield on the inside and outside for safe driving at night. 
211.5, 2.11.5, night driving procedures, vehicle procedures. Make sure that you are rested and alert. If you are drowsy, sleep before you drive. Even a nap can save your life or the lives of others. If you wear eyeglasses, make sure they are clean and unscratched. Do not wear sunglasses at night. Do a complete vehicle inspection. Pay attention to checking all lights and reflectors and cleaning those you can reach. Avoid blinding others. <clears throat> Glare from your headlights can cause problems for drivers coming towards you. They can also bother drivers going in the same direction you are when your lights shine on their rearview mirrors. Dim your lights before they cause glare for other drivers. Dim your lights within 500 feet of an oncoming vehicle and when following another vehicle within 500 feet. Avoid glare from oncoming vehicles. Do not look directly at lights of oncoming vehicles. Look slightly to the right at a right lane or edge marking, if available. If other drivers do not put their low beams on, do not try to get them back by putting your own high beams on. This increases glare for oncoming drivers and increases the chance of an accident. <clears throat> Use high beams when you can. Some drivers make the mistake of always using low beams. This seriously cuts down on their ability to see ahead. Use high beams when it is safe and legal to do so. Use them when you are not within 500 feet of an approaching vehicle. Also, do not let the inside of your cab get too bright. This makes it harder to see outside. Keep the interior light off and adjust your instrument lights as low as you can to still be able to read the gauges. If you get sleepy, stop at the nearest safe place. People often do not realize how close they are to falling asleep even when their eyelids are falling shut. If you can safely do so, look at yourself in a mirror. If you look sleepy or just feel sleepy, stop driving. You are in a very dangerous condition. The only safe cure is to sleep. Driving 2.12, driving in fog. Fog can occur at any time. Fog on highways can be extremely dangerous. Fog is often unexpected and visibility can deteriorate rapidly. You should watch for foggy conditions and be ready to reduce your speed. Do not assume the fog will thin out after you enter it. The best advice for driving in fog is do not. It is preferable that you pull off the road into a rest area or truck stop until visibility is better. If you must drive, be sure to consider the following. First, obey all fog related warning signs. Next, slow down before you enter fog. Next, use low beam headlights and fog lights for best visibility even in daytime and be alert for other drivers who may have forgotten to turn on their lights. Next, turn on your four-way emergency flashers. This will give vehicles approaching you from behind a better opportunity to notice your vehicle. Next, Watch for vehicles on the side of the roadway. Seeing taillights or headlights in front of you may not be a true indication of where the road is ahead of you. The vehicle may not be on the road at all. Next, use roadside highway reflectors as guides to determine how the, cur how the road may curve ahead of you. Next, listen for traffic that you cannot see. Next, avoid passing other vehicles. Next, do not stop along the side of the road unless absolutely necessary. 2.13, driving in winter, 2.13.1, vehicle checks. Make sure your vehicle is ready before driving in winter weather. You should make a regular vehicle inspection, paying extra attention to the following items. First, coolant level and antifreeze amount. Make sure the cooling system is full and there is enough antifreeze in the system to protect against freezing, to protect against freezing. This can be checked with a special coolant tester. Next, defrosting and heating equipment. Make sure the defrosters work. They are needed for safe driving. Make sure the heater is working and that you know how to operate it. If you use other heaters and expect to need them, such as 
mirror heaters, battery box heaters, or fuel tank heaters, check their operation. Next, wipers and washers. Make sure the windshield wiper blades are in good condition. Make sure the wiper blades press against the window hard enough to wipe the windshield clean. Otherwise, they may not sweep off snow properly. Make sure the windshield washer sure the windshield washer works and there is washing fluid in the washer reservoir. Use windshield washer antifreeze to prevent freezing of the washer liquid. If you cannot see well enough while driving, for example, if your wipers fail, stop safely and fix the problem. Next is tires. Make sure you have enough tread on your tires. The drive tires must provide traction to push the rig over wet pavement and through snow. The steering tires must have traction to steer the vehicle. Enough tread is especially important in winter conditions. You must have at least 4 30 seconds inch tread depth in every major groove on front tires and at least 2 30 seconds inch on other tires. More would be better. Use a gauge to determine if you have enough tread for safe driving. Tire chains. You may find yourself in conditions where you cannot drive without chains even to get to a place of safety. Carry the right number of chains and extra cross links. Make sure they will fit your drive tires. Check the chains for broken hooks, worn or broken cross links, and bent or broken side chains. Learn how to put the chains on before you need to do it in the snow and ice. Lights and reflectors. Make sure the lights and reflectors are clean. Lights and reflectors are especially important during bad weather. Check from time to time during bad weather to make sure they are clean and working properly. Windows and mirrors. Remove any ice, snow, and so on from the windshield, windows, and mirrors before starting. Use a windshield scraper, snow brush, and windshield defroster as necessary. Handholds, steps, and deck plates. Remove all ice and snow from handholds, steps, and deck plates. This will reduce the danger of slipping. <coughs> Radiator shutters and winter front. Remove ice from radiator shutters. Make sure the winter front is not closed too tightly. <coughs> if the shutters freeze shut or the winter front is closed too much, the engine may overheat and stop. Exhaust system. Exhaust system leaks are especially dangerous when cab ventilation may be poor, windows rolled up, and so on. Loose connections could permit poisonous carbon monoxide to leak into your vehicle. Carbon monoxide gas will cause you to be sleepy. In large enough amounts, it can kill you. Check the exhaust system for loose parts and for sounds and signs of leaks. 2.13.2 .2, Driving on slippery surfaces slippery surfaces. Drive slowly and smoothly on slippery roads. If it is very slippery, you should not drive at all. Stop at the first safe place. Start gently and slowly. When first starting, get the feel of the road. Do not hurry. Next, check for ice. Check for ice on the road, especially bridges and overpasses. A lack of spray from other vehicles indicates ice has formed on the road. Also, check your mirrors and wiper blades for ice. If they have ice, the road most likely will be icy as well. Adjust turning and braking to conditions. Make turns as gently as possible. Do not brake any harder than necessary and do not use the engine brake or speed retarder. They can cause the driving wheels to skid on slippery surfaces. Adjust speed to conditions. Do not pass slower vehicles unless necessary. Go slowly and watch far enough ahead to keep a steady speed. Avoid having to slow down and speed up. Take curves at slower speeds and do not brake while in curves. 
be aware that as the temperature rises to the point where ice begins to melt, the road becomes even more slippery. Slow down more. Adjust space to conditions. Do not drive alongside other vehicles. Keep a longer following distance. When you see a traffic jam ahead, slow down or stop to wait for it to clear. Try hard to anticipate stops early and slow down gradually. Watch for snow plows as well as salt and sand trucks and give them plenty of room. Wet brakes. When driving in heavy rain or deep standing water, your brakes will get wet. Water in the brakes can cause the brakes to be weak, apply unevenly, or grab. This can cause lack of braking power, wheel lockups, pulling to one side or the other, and jackknife if you pull a trailer. Avoid driving through deep puddles or flowing water if possible. If not, you should slow down and place transmission in a low gear. Next, gently put on the brakes. This presses linings against brake drums or discs and keeps mud, silt, sand, and water from getting in. Next, increase engine RPM and cross the water while keeping light pressure on the brakes. Next, maintain light pressure on the brakes for a short distance to heat them up and dry them out when out of the water. Next, make a test stop when safe to do so. Check behind to make sure no one is following and then apply the brakes to be sure they work well. If not, dry them out further as described above. Caution. Do not apply too much brake pressure and accelerator at the same time because you can overheat brake drums and linings. 2.14 Driving in very hot weather 2.14.1 Vehicle checks Do a normal vehicle inspection but pay attention but pay special attention to the following items. Tires Check the tire mounting and air pressure Inspect the tires every two hours or every 100 miles when driving in very hot weather. Air pressure increases with temperature. Do not let air out or the pressure will be too low when the tires cool off. <clears throat> if a tire is too hot to touch, remain stopped until the tire cools off. Otherwise, the tire may blow out or catch fire. Engine oil. The engine oil helps keep the engine cool as well as lubricate it. Make sure there is enough engine oil. If you have an oil temperature gauge, make sure the temperature is within the proper range while you are driving. Engine coolant. Before starting out, make sure the engine cooling system has enough water and antifreeze according to the engine's manufacturer's directions. According to the engine manufacturer's directions. Antifreeze helps the engine under hot conditions as well as cold conditions. When driving, check the water temperature or coolant temperature gauge from time to time. Make sure it remains in the normal range. If the gauge goes above the highest safe temperature, there may be something wrong that could lead to engine failure and possibly fire. Stop driving as soon as possible, as soon as safely possible, and try to find out what is wrong. Some vehicles have sight glasses, see-through coolant overflow containers, or coolant recovery containers. These permit you to check the coolant level while the engine is hot. If the container is not part of the pressurized system, the cap can be safely removed and coolant added even when the engine is at operating temperature. Never remove the radiator cap or any part of the pressurized system until the system has cooled. Steam and boiling water can spray under pressure and cause severe burns. If you can touch the radiator cap with your bare hand, it is probably cool enough to open. If coolant has to be added to a system without a recovery tank or overflow tank, follow these steps. First. Shut the engine off. Next, wait until the engine has cooled. Next, protect your hands. Use gloves or a thick cloth. Next, turn the radiator cap slowly.
to the first stop, which releases the pressure seal. Next, step back while pressure is released from the cooling system. Next, when all pressure has been released, press down on the cap and turn it further to remove it. Next, visually check the level of coolant and add more coolant if necessary. Finally, replace the cap and turn it all the way to the closed position. Engine belts. <clears throat> learn how to check V belt tightness, learn how to check V, like Victor, belt tightness on your vehicle by pressing on the belts. Loose belts will not turn the water pump and or fan properly. This will result in overheating. Also, check belts for cracking or other signs of wear. Hoses. Make sure coolant hoses are in good condition. A broken hose while driving can lead to engine failure and even fire. 2.14.2 Driving in the heat. Watch for bleeding tar. Tar in the road pavement frequently rises to the surface in very hot weather. Spots where tar bleeds to the surface are very slippery. Go slowly enough to prevent overheating. High speeds create more heat for the tires and engine. In desert conditions, the heat may build up to the point where it is dangerous. The heat will increase chances of tire failure or even fire and engine failure. Subsections 2.11, 2.12, 2.13 and 2.14. Test your knowledge. 1. You should use low beams whenever you can. True or false? Question 2. What should you do before you drive if you are drowsy? Question 3. What effects can wet, can wet brakes cause? How can you avoid these problems? Question 4. You should let air out of hot tires so the pressure goes back to normal. True or false? Question five. You can safely remove the radiator cap as long as the engine is not overheated. True or false? These questions may be on the test. If you cannot answer all of them, reread subsections 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, and 2.14. <clears throat> Continuing, 2.15. Railroad Highway Crossings. Railroad highway grade crossings are a special kind of intersection where the roadway crosses train tracks. These crossings are always dangerous. Every such crossing must be approached with the expectation that a train is coming. It is extremely difficult to judge the distance of the trains from the crossing, as well as the speed of an approaching train. 2.15.1 Types of Crossings Passive Crossings This type of crossing does not have any type of traffic control device. The decision to stop or proceed rests entirely in your hands. Passive Crossings require you to recognize the crossing, search for any train using the tracks, and decide if there is sufficient clear space to cross safely. Active crossings. This type of crossing has a traffic control device installed at the crossing to regulate traffic at the crossing. These active devices include flashing red lights with or without bells, and flashing red lights with bells and gates. 2.15.2 .2. Warning Signs and Devices Advanced Warning Signs <clears throat> The round black on yellow warning sign is placed ahead of a public railroad highway crossing. The advanced warning sign tells you to slow down, look and listen for the train and be prepared to stop at the tracks if the train is coming. All passenger and hazmat carrying vehicles are required to stop. See figure 2.15. Pavement markings. Pavement markings mean the same as advanced warning signs. 
They consist of an X with the letters RR and a no passing marking on two lane roads. See figure 2.16. There is also a no passing zone sign on two lane roads. There may be a white stop line painted on the pavement before the railroad tracks. The front of a school bus must remain behind this line while stopped at the crossing. Cross buck signs. This sign marks the grade crossing. It requires you to yield the right of way to the train. If there is no white stop line painted on the pavement, vehicles that are required to stop must stop no closer than 15 feet or more than 50 feet from the nearest rail of the nearest track. When the road crosses over more than one track, a sign below the crossbuck indicates the number of tracks. See figure 2.17. I'll take pictures of these and include them at the end of the at the uh, end of the recording, end of the video. Flashing red light signals. At many railroad highway grade crossings, the cross buck sign has flashing red lights and bells. When the lights begin to flash, stop. A train is approaching. You are required to yield the right of way to the train. If there is more than one track, make sure all tracks are clear before crossing. See figure 2.18. Gates. Many railroad highway crossings have gates with flashing red lights and bells. Stop when the lights begin to flash and before the gate lowers across the road lane. Remain stopped until the gates go up and the lights have stopped flashing. Proceed when it is safe. See figure 2.18. Driving procedures. Never race a train to a crossing. Never attempt to race a train to a crossing. It is extremely difficult to judge the speed of an approaching train. Reduce speed. Speed must be reduced in accordance with your ability to see approaching trains in any direction, and speed must be held to a point which will permit you to stop short of the tracks in case a stop is necessary. Do not expect to hear a train. Trains may not or are prohibited from sounding horns when approaching some crossings. Public crossings where trains do not sound horns should be identified by signs. Noise inside your vehicle may also prevent you from hearing the train horn until the train is dangerously close to the crossing. Do not rely on signals. You should not rely solely upon the presence of warning signals, gates, or flagmen to warn of the approach of trains. Be especially alert at crossings that do not have gates or flashing red light signals. Double tracks require a double check. Remember that a train, remember that a train on one track may hide a train on the other track. Look both ways before crossing. After one train has cleared a crossing, be sure no other trains are near before starting across the tracks. Yard areas and grade crossings in cities and towns are just as dangerous as rural grade crossings. Approach them with as much caution. 2.15.4 Stopping Safety at Railroad Highway Crossings A full stop is required at grade crossings whenever, first, the nature of the cargo makes a stop mandatory under state or federal regulations. Next, such a stop is otherwise required by law. When stopping, be sure to check the traffic behind you and while stopping gradually, use a pullout lane if available. And finally, turn on your four-way emergency flashers. 2.15.5, crossing the tracks. Railroad crossings with steep approaches can cause your unit to hang up on the tracks. 
Never permit traffic conditions to trap you in a position where you have to stop on the tracks. Be sure you can get all the way across the tracks before you start across. It takes a typical tractor trailer unit at least 14 seconds to clear a single track and more than 15 seconds to clear a double track. Do not shift gears while crossing railroad tracks. 2.15.6 Special Situations Be aware. These trailers can get stuck on raised crossings. Low slung units such as low boy, car carrier, moving van, or possum belly livestock trailer. Next, single axle tractor pulling a long trailer with its landing gear set to accommodate a tandem axle tractor. If for any reason you get stuck on the tracks, get out of the vehicle and away from the tracks. Check signposts or signal housing at the crossing for emergency notification information. Call 911 or other emergency number. Give the location of the crossing using all identifiable landmarks, especially the DOT number if posted. 2.16 Mountain Driving In mountain driving, gravity plays a major role. On any upgrade, gravity slows you down. The steeper the grade, the longer the grade, and or the heavier the load, the more you will have to use lower gears to climb hills or mountains. In coming down long, steep downgrades, gravity causes the speed of your vehicle to increase. You must select an appropriate safe speed and then use a low gear and proper braking techniques. You should plan ahead and obtain information about any long, steep grades along your planned route of travel. If possible, talk to other drivers who are familiar with the grades to find out what speeds are safe. You must go slowly enough so your brakes can hold you back without getting too hot. If the brakes become too hot, they may start to fade, in quotes. This means you have to apply them harder and harder to get the same stopping power. If you continue to use the brakes hard, they can keep fading until you cannot slow down or stop at all. 2.16.1 Select a safe speed. Your most important consideration is to select a speed that is not too fast for the first, total weight of the vehicle and cargo, second, the length of the grade, third, the steepness of the grade, fourth, road conditions, fifth, weather, and that was it. If a speed limit is posted or there is a sign indicating, quote, maximum safe speed, unquote, never exceed the speed shown. Also, look for and heed warning signs indicating the length and steepness of the grade. You must use the braking effect of the engine as a principal way of controlling your speed. The braking effect of the engine is greatest when it is near the governed RPMs and the transmission is in the lower gears. Save the brakes so you will be able to slow down or stop if required by road and traffic conditions. 2.16.2 Select the right gear before starting down the grade. Shift the transmission to a low gear before starting down the grade. Do not try to downshift after your speed has already built up. You will not be able to shift into a lower gear. You may not even be able to get back into any gear and all engine braking effect will be lost. Forcing an automatic transmission into a lower gear at a high speed could damage the transmission and also lead to loss of all engine braking effect. With older trucks, a rule for choosing gears is to use the same gear going down a hill that you would need to, cli to climb the hill. However, new trucks have low friction parts and streamlined shapes for fuel economy. They may also have more powerful engines. This means they can go up hills in higher gears and have less friction and air drag to hold them back going down hills. For that reason, drivers of modern trucks may have to use lower gears going down a hill than required to go up the hill. 
you should know what is right for your vehicle. 2.16.3 Brake Fading or Failure Brakes are designed so brake shoes or pads rub against the brake drum or discs to slow the vehicle. Braking creates heat, but brakes are designed to take a lot of heat. However, brakes can fade or fail from excessive heat caused by using them too much and not relying on the engine braking effect. Brake fade is also affected by adjustment. To safely control a vehicle, every brake must do its share of the work. Brakes out of adjustment will stop doing their share before those that are in adjustment. The other brakes can then overheat and fade and there will not be enough braking available to control the vehicle. Brakes can get out of adjustment quickly, especially when they are used a lot. Also, brake linings wear faster when they are hot. Therefore, Brake adjustment must be checked frequently. 2.16.4 Proper Braking Technique Remember, the use of brakes on a long and or steep downgrade is, the, is only a supplement to the braking effect of the engine. Once the vehicle is in the proper low gear, the following are the proper braking techniques. 1. Apply the brakes just hard enough to feel a definite slowdown. 2. When your speed has been reduced to approximately 5 miles per hour below your safe speed, release the brakes. This brake application should last for about 3 seconds. When your speed has increased to your safe speed, repeat steps 1 and 2. For example, if your safe speed is 40 miles per hour, you would not apply the brakes until your speed reaches 40 miles per hour. Now, apply the brakes hard enough to gradually reduce your speed to 35 miles per hour and then release the brakes. Repeat this as often as necessary until you have reached the end of the downgrade. Escape ramps have been built on many steep mountain downgrades. Escape ramps are made to stop runaway vehicles safely without injuring drivers and passengers. Escape ramps use a long bed of loose, soft material to slow a runway, runaway vehicle, sometimes in combination with an upgrade. No escape ramp locations on your route. Signs show drivers where ramps are located. Escape ramps save lives, equipment, and cargo. Subsections 2.15 and 2.16 test your knowledge. 1. What factors determine your selection of a safe speed when going down a long, steep downgrade? Question 2. Why should you be in the proper gear before starting down a hill? Question 3. Describe the proper braking technique when going down a long, steep downgrade. Question 4. What type of vehicles can get stuck on a railroad highway crossing? Question 5. How long does it take a typical tractor trailer unit to clear a double track. These questions may be on the test. If you cannot answer them all, reread subsections 2.15 and 2.16. 2.17 Driving Emergencies Traffic emergencies occur when two vehicles are about to collide. Vehicle emergencies occur when tires, brakes, or other critical parts fail. Following the safety practices in this handbook can help you prevent emergencies. If an emergency does happen, your chances of avoiding an accident depend on how well you take action. Actions you can take are discussed below. 2.17.1 Steering to avoid an accident Stopping is not always the safest thing to do in an emergency. When you do not have enough room to stop, you may have to steer away from what is ahead. Remember, you can almost always turn to miss an obstacle more quickly than you can stop. However, top heavy vehicles and tractors with multiple trailers may flip over. Keep both hands on the steering wheel. In order to turn quickly, you must have a firm grip on the steering wheel with both hands. The best way to have both hands 
on the wheel, if there is an emergency, is to keep them there all the time. How to turn quickly and safely. A quick turn can be made safely if it is done the right way. Here are some points that safe drivers use. First, do not apply the brake while you are turning. It is very easy to lock your wheels while turning. If that happens, you may skid out of control. Next, do not turn any more than needed to clear whatever is in your way. The more sharply you turn, the greater the chances of a skid or rollover. Next, be prepared to counter steer, turn the wheel back in the other direction once you have passed whatever was in your path. Unless you are prepared to counter steer, you will not be able to do it quickly enough. You should think of emergency steering and counter steering as two parts of one driving action. Where to steer. In an oncoming, if an oncoming driver has drifted into your lane, a move to your right is best. If that driver realizes what has happened, the natural response will be to return to their own lane. If something is blocking your path, the best direction to steer will depend on the situation. If you have been using your mirrors, you will know which lane is empty and can be used, safely used. If the shoulder is clear, going right may be best. No one is likely to be driving on the shoulder, but someone may be passing you on the left. You will know if you have been using your mirrors. If you are blocked on both sides, a move to the right may be best. At least you will not force anyone into an opposing traffic lane and a possible head-on accident. Leaving the road. In some emergencies, you may have to drive off the road. It may be less risky than facing the accident with another vehicle. Most shoulders are strong enough to support the weight of a large vehicle. Therefore, they offer an available escape route. Here are some guidelines. If you do, leave the road. First, avoid braking. If possible, avoid using the brakes until your speed has dropped by about 20 miles per hour. Then, brake very gently to avoid skidding on a loose surface. Next, keep one set of wheels on the pavement if possible. This helps to maintain control. Finally, stay on the shoulder. If the shoulder is, shoulder is clear, Stay on it until your vehicle has come to a stop. Signal and check your mirrors before pulling back onto the road. Returning to the road. If you are forced to return to the road before you can stop, use the following procedure. First, hold the wheel tightly and sh turn sharply enough to get right back on the road safely. Do not try to edge gradually back onto the road. If you do, your tires might grab unexpectedly and you could lose control. Next, when both front tires are on the paved surface, counter steer immediately. The two turns should be made as a single steer counter steer move. 2.17 How to stop quickly and safely. If somebody suddenly pulls out in front of you, your natural response is to hit the brakes. This is a good response if there is enough distance to stop and you use the brakes correctly. You should brake in a way that will keep your vehicle in a straight line and allow you to turn if it becomes necessary. You can use the controlled braking, in quotes, controlled braking, quote unquote, or stab braking, quote unquote, method. Controlled braking. With this method, you apply the brakes as hard as you can without locking the wheels. Keep steering wheel movements very small while doing this. If you need to make a, large steering, a larger steering adjustment or the wheels lock, release the brakes. Reapply the brakes as soon as you can. Stab braking. Apply your brakes all the way. Next, release the brakes when the wheels lock up. Next. As soon as the wheels start rolling, apply the brakes fully again. It can take up to one second for the wheels to start rolling after you release the brakes. If you reapply the brakes before the wheels start rolling, the vehicle will not straighten out. Note, stab braking can only be done in vehicles without anti-lock brake systems, ABS. Do not jam on the brakes. 
Emergency braking does not mean pushing down on the brake pedal as hard as you can. That will only keep the wheels locked up and cause a skid. If the wheels skid, you cannot control the vehicle. Emergency braking means responding to a hazard by slowing the vehicle. Note, if you drive a vehicle with anti-lock brakes, you should read and follow the directions found in the owner's manual for stopping quickly. Two point seventeen point three brake failure. Brakes kept in good condition rarely fail. Most hydraulic brake failures occur for one of two reasons. Air brakes are discussed in section five. First, loss of hydraulic pressure. Next, brake fade on long hills. Loss of hydraulic pressure. When the system will not build up pressure, the brake pedal will feel spongy and go to the floor. Here are some things you can do. First, downshift. Putting the vehicle into a lower gear will help you to slow the vehicle. Next, pump the brakes. Sometimes pumping the brake pedal will generate enough hydraulic pressure to stop the vehicle. Next, use the parking brake. The parking or emergency brake is separate from the hydraulic brake system. Therefore, it can be used to slow the vehicle. However, be sure to press the release button or pull the release lever at the same time you use the emergency brake so you can adjust the brake pressure and keep the wheels from locking up. Finally, find an escape route. While slowing the vehicle, look for an escape route such as an open field, side street, or escape ramp. Turning uphill is a good way to slow and stop the vehicle. Make sure the vehicle does not start rolling backwards after you stop. Put it in low gear, apply the parking brake, and if necessary, roll back into an obstacle that will stop the vehicle. Brake failure on downgrades. Going slow enough and braking properly will almost always prevent brake failure on long downgrades. However, once the brakes have failed, you will have to look outside your vehicle for something to stop it. The best hope is an escape ramp. If there is one, there will be signs telling you about it. Use it. Ramps are, very, ramps are usually located a few miles from the top of the downgrade. Every year, hundreds of drivers avoid injury to themselves or damage to their vehicles by using escape ramps. Some escape ramps use soft gravel that resists the motion of the vehicle and brings it to a stop. Others turn uphill, using the hill to stop the vehicle and soft gra gravel to hold it in place. Any driver who loses brakes going downhill should use an escape ramp if it is, po if it is available. If you do not use it, your chances of having a serious accident may be much greater. If no escape ramp is available, take the least hazardous escape route you can, such as an open field or a side road that flattens out or turns uphill. Make the move as soon as you know your brakes do not work. The longer you wait, the faster the vehicle will go and the harder it will be to stop. 2.17.4 Tire Failure Recognize tire failure. Quickly knowing you have a tire failure will allow you more time to react. Having just a few extra seconds to remember that you are what you are supposed to do can help. The major signs of tire failure are sound, the loud bang of a blowout is an easily recognized sign. It can take a few seconds for your vehicle to react and you might think it was some other vehicle. Anytime you hear a tire blow, you would be safest to assume that it is yours. Next is vibration. If the vehicle thumps or vibrates heavily, it may be a sign one of the tires has gone flat. With a rear tire, that may be the only sign you get. Feel. If the steering feels heavy, it is probably a sign one of the front tires has failed. Sometimes failure of a rear tire will cause the vehicle to slide back and forth or fishtail. However, 
Dual rear tires usually prevent this. Respond to tire failure. When a tire fails, your vehicle is in danger. You must immediately hold the steering wheel firmly. If a front tire fails, it can twist the steering wheel out of your hands. The only way to prevent this is to keep a firm grip on the steering wheel with both hands at all times. Next, stay off the brake. It is natural to want to brake in an emergency. However, braking when a tire has failed could cause a loss of control. Unless you are about to run into something, stay off the brake until the vehicle is slowed down. Then, brake very gently, pulling off the road, and stop. Next, check the tires. After you have come to a stop, get out and check all the tires. Do this even if the vehicle seems to be handling all right. If one of your dual tires goes, the only way you may know is by getting out and looking at it. 2.18 Anti-Lock Braking Systems ABS ABS is a computerized system that keeps your wheels from locking up during hard braking applications. ABS is an addition to your normal brakes. It does not decrease or increase your normal braking capability. ABS only activates when your wheels are about to lock up. ABS does not necessarily shorten your stopping distance, but it helps you to keep your vehicle under control during hard braking. 2.18.1 How Anti-Lock Braking Systems Work Sensors detect potential wheel lockup. An electronic control unit, or ECU, will then decrease brake pressure to avoid wheel lockup. Next, brake pressure is adjusted to provide the maximum braking without danger of lockup. Next, ABS works far faster than the driver can respond to potential wheel lockup. At all other times, the brake system will operate normally. 2.18.2 .2, Vehicles Required to Have ABS the Department of Transportation, DOT, requires that ABS be on first, truck tractors with air brakes built on or after March 1, 1997. Next, other air brake vehicles, such as trucks, buses, trailers, and converter dollies built on or after March 1, 1998. Next, hydraulically braked trucks and buses with a GVWR of 10,000 pounds or more built on or after March 1, 1999. Many CMVs, or commercial motor vehicles, built before these dates have been voluntarily equipped with ABS. 2.18.3 How to know if your vehicle is equipped with ABS. Tractors, trucks, and buses will have yellow ABS malfunction lamps on the instrument panel. Trailers will have yellow ABS malfunction lamps on the left side, either on the front or rear corner. Dollies, manufactured on or after March 1, 1998, are required to have a yellow lamp on the left side. As a system check on newer vehicles, the malfunction lamp comes on at startup for a bulb check and then goes out quickly. On older, ver on older systems, the lamp could stay on until you are driving over 5 miles per hour. If the lamp stays on after the bulb check or goes on once you are underway, you may have lost ABS control. In the case of towed units manufactured before it was required by the DOT, it may be difficult to tell if the unit is equipped with ABS. Look under the vehicle for the ECU and wheel speed sensor wires coming from the back of the brakes. 2.18.4 How ABS Helps You When you brake hard on slippery surfaces in a vehicle without ABS, your wheels may lock up. When your wheels lock up, you lose steering control. When your other wheels lock up, you may skid, jackknife, or even spin the vehicle. ABS helps you avoid wheel lockup and maintain control. You may or may not be able to stop faster with ABS, but you should be able to steer around an obstacle while braking and avoid skids caused by over braking. 
2.18.5 ABS on the tractor only or only on the trailer. Having the ABS on only the tractor, only the trailer, or even on only one axle still gives you more control over the vehicle during braking. Brake normally. When only the tractor has ABS, you should be able to maintain steering control and there is less chance of jackknifing. However, keep your eye on the trailer and let up on the brakes if you can safely do so, if it begins to swing out. Read that again. However, keep your eye on the trailer and let up on the brakes if you can safely do so, if it begins to swing out. When only the trailer has ABS, the trailer is less likely to swing out. But if you lose steering control or start a tractor jackknife, let up on the brakes if you can safely do so until you regain control. 2.18.6, braking with ABS. When you drive a vehicle with ABS, you should brake as you always have. In other words, use only the braking force necessary to stop safely and stay in control. Brake the same way regardless of whether you have ABS on the bus, tractor, trailer, or both. As you slow down, monitor your tractor and trailer and back off the brakes if it is safe to do so to stay in control. There is only one exception to this procedure. If you drive a straight truck or combination with working ABS on all axles, in an emergency stop, you can fully apply the brakes. 2.18.7, braking if ABS is not working. Without ABS, you still have normal brake functions, drive and brake as you always have. Vehicles with ABS have yellow malfunction lamps to tell you if something is not working. As a system check on newer vehicles, the malfunction lamp comes on at startup for a bulb check and then goes out quickly. On older systems, the lamp could stay on until you are driving over five miles per hour. If the lamp stays on after the bulb check or goes on once you are underway, you may have lost ABS control on one or more wheels. Remember, if your ABS malfunctions, you still have regular brakes. Drive normally, but get the system serviced soon. 2.18.8 Safety Reminders ABS will not allow you to drive faster, follow more closely, or drive less carefully. ABS will not prevent power or turning skids. ABS should prevent brake-induced skids or jackknifes, but not those caused by spinning the drive wheels or going too fast in a turn. ABS will not necessarily shorten stopping distance. ABS will help maintain vehicle control, but not always shorten stopping distance. ABS will not increase or decrease ultimate stopping power. ABS is an add-on to your normal brakes, not a replacement for them. ABS will not change the way you br normally brake. Under normal brake conditions, your vehicle will stop as it always stopped. ABS only comes into play when a wheel would normally have locked up because of overbraking. ABS will not compensate for bad brakes or poor brake maintenance. Remember, the best vehicle safety feature is still a safe driver. Remember, so you never need to use your ABS or drive so you never need to use your ABS. ABS could help to prevent a serious accident. Moving on. 2.19 skid control and recovery. A skid happens whenever the tires lose their grip on the road. This is caused in one of four ways. First, overbraking. Braking too hard and locking up the wheels. Skids also can occur when using the speed retarder when the road is slippery. Next, oversteering. Turning the wheels more sharply than the vehicle can turn. Next, overacceleration, supplying too much power to the drive wheels, causing them to spin. Finally, driving too fast. Most serious skids result from driving too fast for road conditions. Drivers who adjust their driving to road conditions and do not overaccelerate do not have to overbrake or oversteer from too much speed. 2.19.1 Drive wheel skids. 
By far, the most common skid is one in which the rear wheels lose traction through excessive braking or acceleration. Skids caused by acceleration usually happen on ice or snow. Taking your foot off the accelerator can easily stop them. If it is very slippery, push the clutch in. Otherwise, the engine can keep the wheels from rolling freely and regaining traction. Rear wheel braking skids occur when the rear drive wheels lock. Locked wheels have less traction than rolling wheels and the rear wheels usually slide sideways in an attempt to quote, catch up, unquote, with the front wheels. In a bus or straight truck, the vehicle will slide sideways in a spin out. With vehicles towing trailers, a drive wheel skid can let the trailer push the towing vehicle sideways, causing a sudden jackknife. See figure 2.19. I'm going to read that again. With vehicles towing trailers, a drive wheel skid can let the trailer push the towing vehicle sideways, causing a sudden jackknife. 2.19.2 Correcting a drive wheel braking skid. Do the following to correct a drive wheel braking skid. First, stop braking. This will let the rear wheels roll again and keep the rear wheels from sliding. Next, counter steer. As a vehicle turns back on course, it has a tendency to keep on turning. Unless you turn the steering wheel quickly the other way, you may find yourself skidding in the opposite direction. Learning to stay off the brake, turn the steering wheel quickly, push in the clutch, and counter steer in a skid takes a lot of practice. The best place to get this practice is on a large driving range or skid pad. 2.19.3 Front wheel skids. Driving too fast for conditions causes most front wheel skids. Other causes include lack of tread on the front tires and cargo loaded so not enough weight is on the front axle. In a front wheel skid, the front end tends to go in a straight line regardless of how much you turn the steering wheel. On a very slippery surface, you may not be able to steer around a curve or turn. When a front wheel skid occurs, the only way to stop the skid is to let the vehicle slow down. Stop turning and or braking so hard. Slow down as quickly as possible without skidding. Subsections 2.17, 2.18, and 2.19. Test your knowledge. 1. Stopping is not always the safest thing to do in an emergency. True or false? Question 2. Here are some what are some advantages of going right instead of left around an obstacle? Question 3. What is an escape ramp? Question 4. If a tire blows out, you should put on the brakes. You should put the brakes on hard to stop quickly. True or false? Question five. How do you know if your vehicle has anti-lock brakes? Question six. What is the proper braking technique when driving a vehicle with anti-lock brakes? Question seven. How do anti-lock brakes help you? These questions may be used on the test. If you cannot answer them all, reread subsections 2.17, 2.18, and 2.19. 2.20. Accident Procedures. When you are in an accident and not seriously hurt, you need to act to prevent further damage or injury. The basic steps to be taken at any accident are to protect the area, notify authorities, care for the injured, collect required information, report the accident. 2.20.1 Protect the area. The first thing to do at an accident scene is to keep another accident from happening in the same spot. To protect the accident area, 
If your vehicle is involved in the accident, try to get it to the side of the road. This will help prevent another accident and allow traffic to move. Next, if you are stopping to help, park away from the accident. The area immediately around the accident will be needed for emergency vehicles. Next, put on your four-way emergency flashers. Finally, set out reflective triangles to warn other traffic. Make sure other drivers can see them in time to avoid the accident. 2.20.2 Notify authorities. If you have a cell phone or CB radio, call for assistance before you get out of your vehicle. If not, wait until after the accident scene has been properly protected. Then, phone or send someone to phone the police. Try to determine where you are so you can give the exact location. 2.20.3 Care for the Injured If a qualified person is at the accident and helping the injured, stay out of the way unless asked to assist. Otherwise, do the best you can to help any injured parties. Here are some simple steps to follow in giving assistance. First, do not move a severely injured person unless the danger of fire or passing traffic makes it necessary. Next, stop heavy bleeding by applying direct pressure to the wound. Finally, keep the injured person warm. 2.20.4 Gather Information If you were involved in the accident, you will have to file an accident report. Collect the following information for the report. First, names, addresses, and driver's license numbers of drivers involved in the accident. Next, license plate numbers, and types of vehicles involved in the accident. Next, names and addresses of the owners of other vehicles, if different from the drivers. Next, description of the damages to other vehicles or to property. Next, names and addresses of anyone who was injured or involved in the accident. Next, Name, badge number, and agency of any peace officer investigating the accident. Next, names and addresses of witnesses. Next, exact location of the accident. Next, and finally, direction of travel of the vehicles involved. 2.21 Fires Truck fires can cause damage and injury. Learn the causes of fires and how to prevent them. Know what to do to extinguish fires. 2.21.1 Causes of Fire The following are some causes of vehicle fires. First, after accidents. Spilled fuel and improper use of flares. Next, tires. Underinflated tires and dual tires that touch. Next, electrical system. Short circuits due to damaged insulation and loose connections. Next, fuel. Driver smoking, improper fueling, and loose fuel connections. Next, cargo. Flammable cargo, improperly sealed or loaded cargo, and poor ventilation. Read it again. Cargo. Flammable cargo, improperly sealed or loaded cargo, and poor ventilation. 2.21.2 .2, Fire Prevention Pay attention to the following. First, vehicle inspection. Make a complete inspection of the electrical, fuel, and exhaust systems, tires, and cargo. Be sure to check that the fire extinguisher is charged. En route inspection. Check the tires, wheels, and truck body for signs of heat whenever you stop during your, your trip. Next, follow safe procedures. Follow correct safety procedures for fueling the vehicle, using brakes, handling flares, and other activities that can cause a fire. Next, monitoring. Check the instruments and gauges often for signs of overheating and use the mirrors to look for signs of smoke from tires or the vehicle. <clears throat> Next, caution. Use caution handling anything flammable. 
2.21.3 Firefighting Know how to fight fires. Knowing how to fight fires is important. Drivers who did not know what to do have made fires worse. Know how the fire extinguishers work. Read it again. Know how the fire extinguisher works. Study the instructions printed on the extinguisher before you need it. Here are some procedures to follow in case of fire. First, pull off the road. The first step is to get the vehicle off the road and stop. In doing so, park in an open area, away from buildings, trees, brush, other vehicles, or anything that might catch fire. Next, do not pull into a service station. Next, notify emergency services of your problem and location. Keep the fire from spreading. Before trying to put out the fire, make sure that it does not spread any further. With an engine fire, turn off the engine as soon as you can. Do not open the hood if you can avoid it. Shoot foam through louvers, radiator, or from the vehicle's underside. For a cargo fire in a van or box trailer, keep the doors shut, especially if your cargo contains hazmat. Opening the van doors will supply the fire with oxygen and can cause it to burn very fast. Extinguish the fire. Here are some rules to follow in putting out a fire. First, when using the extinguisher, stay as far away from the fire as possible. Next, Aim at the source or base of the fire, not up in the flames. Note, refer to CCR Title 13, 1242 for additional information. Use the correct fire extinguisher. Figures 2.20 and 2.21 detail the type of fire extinguisher to use by class of fire. The BC type fire extinguisher is designed to work on electrical fires and burning liquids. The ABC type is designed to work on burning wood, paper, and cloth as well. Water can be used on wood, paper, or cloth, but do not use water on an electrical fire. This can cause shock or a gasoline fire, which will spread the flames. A burning tire must be cooled. Lots of water may be required. If you are not sure what to use, especially on a hazmat fire, wait for firefighters. Position yourself upwind. Let the wind carry the extinguisher to the fire. Continue until whatever was burning has cooled. Absence of smoke or flame does not mean that the fire cannot restart. And here I have figures 2.20 and 2.21. 2.20 is titled Class Slash Type of Fires. There's two columns and four rows. The columns are called Class and Type. Starting with the, from the beginning, Class Z Type includes wood, paper, ordinary combustibles, Ex uh, and ordinary combustibles. Extinguish by cooling and quenching using water or dry chemicals. That is a class Z. Moving on. Class B, like Bravo. Type. Gasoline, oil, grease, other greasy liquids. Extinguish by smothering, cooling of heat. I'm sorry. Extinguish by smothering, cooling, or heat shielding using carbon dioxide or dry chemicals. The next class is C like Charlie. Moving on to type, this would include electrical equipment fires. Extinguish with non-conducting agents such as carbon dioxide or dry chemicals. Do not use water on an electrical fire. And finally, class D like Delta, Type is fires in combustible metals. Fires in combustible metals, class D, delta. Uh, extinguish by using specialized extinguishing powders. Figure 2.21 is titled 
class of fire slash type of extinguisher. There's two columns. The first one is called class of fire, and the second column is titled fire extinguisher type. There's 11 rows. So starting with number one, classifier, B or C. Fire extinguisher type, regular dry chemical. Next, under classifier, A, B, C, or D. Fire extinguisher type, multi-purpose dry chemical. Classifier, D, a delta. Fire extinguisher type, purple K dry chemical. Classifier, B or C. Fire extinguisher type, Type KCL dry chemical, Kilo Charlie Lima dry chemical. Classifier D like Delta, fire extinguisher type dry powder special compound. Classifier B or C, Bravo or Charlie, fire extinguisher type carbon dioxide dry. Classifier B or C, fire extinguisher type halogenated agent, in parentheses, gas. Classifier A, like alpha, fire extinguisher type, water. Classifier A, like alpha, fire extinguisher type, water with antifreeze. Classifier A or B, alpha or bravo, fire extinguisher type, water, or loaded stream style, water, comma, loaded stream style. Classify, finally, classifier B, bravo, and on some A, some alpha. Fire extinguisher type, foam. Subsections 2.20 and 2.21. <clears throat> Test your knowledge. Question one. What are some things to do at an accident scene to prevent another accident? Question two, name two causes of tire fires. Question three, what kinds of fires is a BC extinguisher not good for? Question four, when using your extinguisher, should you get as close as possible to the fire? Question five, name some causes of vehicle fires. These questions may be on the test. If you cannot answer them all, reread subsections 2.20 and 2.21. Moving on, 2.22, alcohol, other drugs, and driving. 2.22.1, alcohol and driving. Drinking alcohol and then driving is very dangerous and a serious problem. People who drink alcohol are involved in traffic accidents resulting in over 20,000 deaths every year. Alcohol impairs muscle, muscle coordination, reaction time, depth perception, and night vision. It also affects the parts of the brain that control judgment and inhibition. For some people, one drink is all it takes to show signs of impairment. You should know, first, how alcohol works on the human body. Next, how alcohol affects driving. Next, laws regarding drinking, drugs, and driving. And finally, legal, financial, and safety risks of drinking and driving. You may never drink while on duty or consume any intoxicating beverage, regardless of its alcohol content, within four hours before going on duty. And there are two charts here. Figure 2.22, titled, What is a Drink? and approximate blood alcohol content, and then 2.23, which is titled Effects of Increasing Blood Alcohol Content. Uh, blood alcohol content, effects on the body, and effects on driving condition. And I will include pictures of these and all of the appropriate uh, figures or diagrams at the end of the chapter. Remember, <clears throat> it is illegal to drive a commercial motor vehicle with a blood alcohol content that is 0 0.04 or greater, 0.04% or greater. Doing so will result in an immediate administrative driver licensing sanction, admin per se, in accordance with CBC 13353.2 subsection 3. 
You may also be convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, CBC 23152, subsection D. However, a blood alcohol content below 0.04% does not mean that it is safe or legal to drive. How alcohol works. Alcohol goes directly into the bloodstream and is carried to the brain. After passing through the brain, a small percentage is removed in urine, perspiration, and breathing, while the rest is carried to the liver. The liver can only process one-third an ounce of alcohol per hour, which is considerably less than the alcohol in a standard drink. This is a fixed rate, so only time, not black coffee or a cold shower, will sober you up. If you have drinks faster than your body can get rid of them, you will have more alcohol in your body and your driving will be more affected. The blood alcohol content commonly measures, the BAC commonly measures the amount of alcohol in your body. See figure 2.22. All of the following drinks contain the same amount of alcohol. A 12 ounce glass of 5% beer, a 5 ounce glass of 12% wine, a 1 and 1 half ounce shot of 80 proof liquor. What determines blood alcohol concentration? BAC is determined by the amount of alcohol you drink. More alcohol means higher blood alcohol content, BAC. How fast you drink, faster drinking means higher BAC, and your weight. A small person does not have to drink as much to reach the same blood alcohol content. Alcohol and the brain. Alcohol affects more and more of the brain as blood alcohol content builds up. The first part of the brain affected controls judgment and self-control. One of the bad things about this is that it can keep drinkers from knowing that they are getting drunk. Of course, good judgment and self-control are absolutely necessary for safe driving. A blood alcohol, as blood alcohol content continues to build up, muscle control, vision, and coordination are affected more and more. Effects on driving may include straddling lanes, quick jerky starts, not signaling, and failure to use lights, running stop signs and red lights, improper passing, see figure 2.23. These effects mean increased chances of an accident and losing your driver's license. Accident statistics show that the chance of an accident is much greater for drivers who have been drinking than for drivers who have not. How alcohol affects driving. All drivers are affected by drinking alcohol. Alcohol affects judgment, vision, coordination, and reaction time. It causes serious driving errors, such as increased reaction time to hazards, driving too fast or slow, driving in the wrong lane, running over the curb, and weaving. 2.22.2, other drugs. Besides alcohol, other legal and illegal drugs are being used more often. Laws prohibit possession or use of many drugs while on duty. They prohibit being under the influence of any controlled substance. Amphetamines, including pep pills, uppers, and bennies. Narcotics or any other substance, which can make the driver unsafe. This could include a variety of prescription and over-the-counter drugs, such as cold medicines, which may make the driver drowsy or otherwise affect safe driving ability. However, possession and use of a drug given to a driver by a doctor is permitted if the doctor informs the driver that it will not affect safe driving ability. Pay attention to warning labels for legitimate drugs and medicines and to doctor's orders regarding possible effects. Stay away from illegal drugs. Do not use any drugs that hide fatigue. The only cure for, for fatigue is rest. Alcohol can make the effects of other drugs much worse. The safest rule is do not mix drugs while driving at all. Use of drugs can lead to traffic accidents resulting in death, injury, and property damage. 
Furthermore, it can lead to arrest, fines, and jail sentences. It can also mean the end of a person's driving career. 2.22.3. Illness. Occasionally, you may become so ill that you cannot operate a motor vehicle safely. If this happens to you, you must not drive. However, in case of an emergency, you may drive to the nearest place where you can safely stop. 2.23 Hazardous Materials Rules for All Commercial Drivers All drivers should know something about hazmat. You must be able to recognize hazardous cargo and know whether or not you can haul it without having an H endorsement on your CDL. If you apply for an original or renewal H endorsement, you must undergo a Transportation Security Administration Federal Security Threat Assessment TSA Background Records Check. You start the TSA Background Records Check after you apply for your CDL at DMV, successfully complete all appropriate knowledge tests, and submit a valid medical form. You must submit fingerprints, a fee, and any additional required information to one of TSA's designated agents. You must also provide the TSA agent with a copy of your CLP and one of the following ID documents. A California driver's license slash ID card, an out-of-state driver's license, your CLP accompanied by a DMV photo receipt, and that, that's it. For a list of TSA agent sites, visit universalenroll.dhs.gov or call 1-855-347-8371. 2.23.1. What are hazardous materials? Hazmat are products that pose a risk to health, safety, and property during transportation. See figure 2.24. 2.23.2. Why are there rules? You must follow the many rules about transporting hazmat. The intent of the rules is to contain the product, communicate the risk, ensure safe drivers and equipment. Starting with contain the product. Many hazardous products can injure or kill on contact. To protect drivers and others from contact, the rules tell shippers how to package products safely. Similar rules tell drivers how to load, transport, and unload bulk tanks. These are containment rules. Communicate the risk. The shipper uses a shipping paper and diamond-shaped hazard labels to warn dock workers and drivers of the risk. After an accident or hazmat spill or leak, you may be injured and unable to communicate the hazards of the material you are transporting. Firefighters and police can prevent or reduce the amount of damage or injury at the scene if they know what hazmat is being transported. Your life and the lives of others may depend on quickly locating the hazmat shipping papers. For that reason, you must identify shipping papers related to hazmat or keep them on top of other shipping papers. You must also keep shipping papers in or on a pouch on the driver's door, in clear view within reach while driving, on the driver's seat when out of the vehicle. 2.23.3 Lists of Regulated Products <clears throat> Placards are used <clears throat> to warn others of hazmat. Placards are signs put on the outside of a vehicle that identify the hazard class of the cargo. A placarded vehicle must have at least four identical placards. They are put on the front, rear, and both sides. Placards must be readable from all four directions. They must be at least 9.84 inches square, which is the same as 250 millimeters, turned upright on a point and in a diamond shape. Cargo tanks and other bulk packaging display the ID number of their contents on placards or orange panels, CVC 27903. ID numbers are a four-digit code used by first responders to identify hazmat. An ID number may be used to identify more than one chemical on shipping papers. 
the ID number will be preceded by the letters NA or UN. The U.S. Department of Transportation Emergency Response Guidebook, ERG, lists the chemicals and the ID numbers assigned to them. Not all vehicles carrying hazmat need to have placards. The rules about placards are given in Section 9 of this handbook. You can drive a vehicle that carries hazmat if it does not require placards. If it requires placards, you cannot drive it unless your driver's license has an H endorsement. See Figure 2.25. The rules require all drivers of placarded vehicles to learn how to safely load and transport hazardous products and to have a CDL with the H endorsement. To get the required endorsement, you must pass a knowledge test on material found in Section 9 of this handbook. An X endorsement, which is what I have, is required for CMVs, commercial motor vehicles, that transport liquid or gaseous materials within a tank or tanks having an individual rated capacity of more than 119 gallons and an aggregate rated capacity of 1,000 gallons or more that is either permanently or temporarily attached to the vehicle or chassis. A commercial motor vehicle transporting an empty storage container tank not designed for transportation with a rated capacity of 1,000 gallons or more that is temporarily attached to a flatbed trailer is not considered a tank vehicle per CFR Title 49, 383.5. Note, an N endorsement, as in November, is not necessary for the operation of vehicles that do not require a CDL. Drivers who need the H endorsement, as in hotel, must learn the placard rules. If you do not know if your vehicle needs placards, ask your employer. Never drive a vehicle needing placards unless you have the H endorsement. To do so is a crime. When stopped, you will be cited and you will not be allowed to drive your truck. It will cost you time and money. A failure to placard when needed may risk your life and the lives of others if you have an accident. Emergency help will not know of your hazardous cargo. Drivers who need an H endorsement must also know which products they can load together and which they cannot. These rules are also in Section 9. Before loading a truck with more than one type of product, you must know if it is safe to load them together. If you do not know, ask your employer and consult the regulations. Subsections 2.22 and 2.23. Test your knowledge. Question number one. Common medicines for colds can make you sleepy. True or false? Question number two. Coffee and a little fresh air will help a drinker sober up. True or false? Question number three. What is a hazmat placard? <clears throat> Question number four. Why are placards used? These questions may be on the test. If you cannot answer them all, reread subsections 2.22 and 2.23.